The next thing that I want to ask you is a paper that you co-authored in 2020 about alpha ketoglutarate, uh, which seemed to show lifespan extension in female mice, but across the board it seemed to extend health span. Um, yeah. So yeah, I'm really interested to pick your brain about this trial and about alpha ketoglutarate. Yeah. First of all, I don't think there's a huge gender difference here. There was a trend toward extension in males. Uh, and if you put four cohorts we've done together, you actually get statistical significance now. Of course, if you do that, you pub try to publish a paper, the reviewers will you know, uh, tell you that's not the right thing to do, which is, I understand. Uh, but I do think there's a small benefit in males as well. Uh, so we started this treatment at 18 months and with a uh, not that high of a dose of alpha ketoglutarate. And so we got about, a, like I said, around a 10% extension in lifespan, but a 50% reduction in frailty. So we want to argue that this compound is uh, compressing morbidity in mice. It's keeping them healthy very late, and then they kind of crash at the end. Uh, that would be uh, optimal if it worked that way in humans. Of course, we have, we're trying to test that. Um, and this came out of a, a lot of research. So a company called Ponce de Leon Health uh, worked with Gordon Lithgow and I at the Bach. And first thing we did is take a lot of natural products that uh, were reported to affect aging in one way or another, and we tested them in worms, took the ones that work and started combining them together. Uh, the idea is to find combinations that have effects on aging because you can get IP around combinations of natural products, but not single ones. Uh, and also to sort of survey the landscape to see uh, what's going on. And so by far our biggest hit was alpha ketoglutarate out of that. There are other things that we saw benefits from and the product that they rejuvent that they sell is uh, has contains uh, alpha ketoglutarate and vitamin A for men and alpha ketoglutarate and vitamin D for women. So, uh, and that's because we saw beneficial effects on frailty by combining the two. Um, and I can, I'm inter I can come back to vitamins if you're interested to it. I think we're, I'm very interested in those in aging. But AKG is, it seems to have a robust effect. We're now doing uh, controlled clinical studies. By we, I'm, I'm part of this company too. Ponce de Leon Health is sponsoring controlled clinical studies at Indiana University. And we should have data back on that in the near future. And that's with the product. And here at NUS, we're going to test just alpha ketoglutarate because I want to get a better handle on mechanism and not have the complication of the other ingredients. Uh, one of the things we found is that the sustained release version that we've generated probably works better than uh, ones that mon AKG that's not sustained release because it, it gets through the gut and slowly releases AKG throughout the day. Um, it has a lot of effects. It's sort of like, you know, sirtuins and tor, and that if you start looking at pillars of aging, you see benefits. Uh, and it, it, it's a lot like NAD in the sense that it participates in hundreds of uh, reactions in the cell. And so you, it's not an obvious place to figure out which, which reactions are important. So, you, you know, with NAD, yeah, it activates sirtuins, but it activates a lot of enzymes and, and it could be others that are linked to aging too. AKG is the same. So both these metabolites go down and you're trying to add them back. Uh, the, uh, um, so we're kind of beating our heads against the wall trying to understand the, the mechanisms of action of, of alpha ketoglutarate right now. Uh, we have a lot of people that have taken the product and done methylation tests uh, with a company called Trumi Labs. And they've... Uh, shown that you know they have a reduction in biologic age. We're trying to publish this paper after six months of taking the products. This is obviously not a controlled, placebo-controlled study. Uh, people paying money to buy the product, and so they're highly motivated to see an effect. It has you know those kinds of issues, but it's very promising, and we hope we see something similar in the controlled clinical studies. Awesome. Because one of the questions that I, I'm very curious about, when I first read this paper, I think it was sometime last year, it was talking about the how much alpha ketoglutarate was being given to these mice. And it was, from what I can gather, it was 2% of their diet, which to me yeah. sounds quite a lot, yeah. and if, if you try and extrapolate that to a human diet. Yeah. So Yeah, and I, I think we, we, you know, we had a a limited ability to test different doses. And so one of the things we're doing in mice is going back and testing different doses. Uh, I'll say that the, um, 
AKG, you can take a lot of it in human studies without toxicity. So there have been a lot of clinical studies on this molecule. Bodybuilders have been pouring it in their bodies for a long time. Endurance athletes use it. Um, there was a study on osteoporosis where I believe they went to 10 grams a day in humans, which is like, you know, lunch. <laughs> and uh, without, and they showed benefits for uh, postmenopausal uh, loss of bone density, but they also saw no toxicity in six months of that. So I think that this is a very safe molecule and it's, it's not, so what we're, what's in the product is actually maybe lower than which should be. And so one of the things we want to go back and is do higher levels of testing in humans when we do the study here in the US. Um, I think that uh, um, I, I've tried, I tried doubling the dose and the, that's recommended and I'm not dead yet. So that's a good sign. <laughs> so the, uh, the um, uh, but we really don't know what the appropriate dose for AKG is, but we didn't want to start with a very high level in humans because of, even though there's a lot of good safety data on it, you know, we wanted to be careful first. And this study we're doing at IU is a, uh, Ostensibly, it's a safety study, uh, even though none of the products we, none of the uh, ingredients we have in the product is, they all have very high, very good safety profiles at the dose we're recommending. But we want to validate that first and then go forward. When do you think those trials would be published so that we can we can read well, them? Hopefully, in the next six to nine months. I mean, it got pandemic i think we should make i've made pandemic into a verb at this point <laughs> yeah um because you know we just started the trial and everything had to shut down and and actually i'm still hopeful we'll see some really good data out of it but it's a bit scary because if you look at the control parameters for people that are under the placebo control they're all over the map right now because you had people that were they were working they weren't working the restaurants were closed they were locked down they were sick so you can see people in some of the uh, clinical markers we're using that they were sick, you know, so it's, uh, um, it's not going to be the best, I think, not just for ours, but for any of these, any studies right now, it's not going to be the best time to have done clinical trials. I think we're going to see a, a lot of squiggly lines on the control side. So hopefully we'll still see some benefits uh, and we're, we're going to be able to really analyze that data in the near future, but it always takes time to put it together and publish. So it's uh uh, but I've, I, I think that um, I'm still optimistic that this is going to do something interesting.